Ahoy there, mateys, and avast. Settle yourself down, and I'll tell you a tale of piracy and video games. To be sure, we're talking about the illegal kind of piracy. Immoral, uncouth trampling of the rights and property of others. Um, you know, the one with the boats. So let loose the mainsails, and shiver your timbers, as we embark on an adventure through the golden era of naval exploitation. Or, to put it another way, Yo-ho-ho, ho, and a barrel of fun. It is mildly ironic that perhaps the first video game about pirates opens with a message condemning the act of software piracy. Even as far back as 1978, it was an issue. Pirate Adventure was an early text-based game released for 8-bit home systems, in which you're whisked off to a magical world of pirates and plunder. Although crude by today's standards, text adventures mark the emergence of interactive fiction, games with a focus on narrative and storytelling. The fantasy world of pirates lends itself well to such adventures, a blend of escapism, exploration, and intrinsic peril. Of course, the world was obsessed with Star Wars during this time, so celestial-themed shoot-'em-ups like Space Invaders were dominant by the 1980s. 1984's booty bucked the trend, however, with this pirate-themed title proving an 8-bit hit, becoming the first video game to shift a 100,000 copies in the UK. You play a cabin boy who takes it upon himself to plunder his own master's ship, navigating a sequence of screens with platforms and puzzles, not to mention parrots and pirates. Drawing straight from literature is Treasure Island from the same year, a top-down romp through Robert Louis Stevenson's work. Such tales travel, and indeed, pirates are not an exclusive phenomenon to the West, as Japanese arcades saw pirate ship Higemaru bring nautical action to the maze genre. Sailor Momotaro is able to pick up and roll barrels on deck, with the object of the game being to defeat the pirate crew who roam the level. The NES saw a sequel in Higemaru Makaijima, or Hell's Island Great Adventure of Seven Islands, although the game was never released outside of Japan. The expanded adventure mode saw the player explore the ocean in pursuit of seven keys held by rival pirate captains. There was similar skullduggery in Skull and Crossbones from Atari. An evil wizard makes off with your booty, and over the course of the game, it is your quest to restock your holds with filthy lucre. A ribald romp in romantic interactive fiction is Infocom's Plundered Hearts which thrusts you into the heroine's shoes amongst a cast of corsairs and other assorted ne'er-do-wells. It was an adventurous attempt to bring a popular genre of fiction to interactive form, but it would be Infocom's first and last attempt at doing so. Far more successful was the work of a certain Sid Meier. The aptly titled Pirates, a change in direction from his earlier combat simulation games. Most impressive was the sheer scope. It encompassed everything you might expect in a pirate's career. From naval combat to fencing, politics and treasure hunting, the game was simply too broad to do everything within a single playthrough. Its open-ended gameplay reflected the freedom you enjoy as a pirate, with the whole of the Caribbean to explore, at least as long as your good health holds out. Its breadth offered substantial replayability, and as far as pirate strategy games are concerned, it would be a while before anything could match it. 8-bit eggy mascot Dizzy's second outing stranded him on a treasure island, with a sequence of inventory-based puzzles needed to escape. Brutally hard unless you knew what you were doing, as you only had one life, and a single hit could kill. Adventure games such as Dizzy represent the pinnacle of 8-bit graphic adventures, but by the 90s there was a new wave of more powerful 16-bit machines. The Secret of Monkey Island was the first of a much-loved franchise, and it's perhaps where most minds wander when called to think of a game about pirates. It did much to make the adventure genre more accessible, with its pirating premise, lavish graphics, humorous writing, and perhaps most significantly, an absence of player death. Previous games of the genre had a reputation for severely punishing mistakes. Wander too far off a cliff, or spend too long in the dark, and your game would come to an abrupt halt. Not so in Monkey Island, save for one exception. 
You could explore and interact with everything with no ill consequences, encouraging experimentation within the compelling world. The game's tone was light-hearted throughout. On Monkey Island, sword fights are not resolved by violence, but instead by wit. Insults are exchanged instead of blows, and the pirate with the best comebacks would emerge the victor. Its sequel, Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge, didn't disappoint either. With beautiful hand-painted backdrops and an even more expansive piratical adventure spanning three major islands. The humour remained with a cast of colourful characters and an array of piratical activities, from entering a spitting contest, epic treasure huntery, and gatecrashing a Mardi Gras costume party. A diverse land of seafaring, zombie pirates, and voodoo. Not to mention its fair share of obtuse puzzles. The JRPG equivalent to Sid Meier's Pirates, Uncharted Waters, puts the player in charge of a ship and gives them free reign to explore the world. The second instalment, Uncharted Waters New Horizons, was released a couple of years later, this time giving you a choice of sailors, each with a different career. The game took advantage of the 16-bit systems too, with a more detailed world and an expansion of the RPG elements, including ship-to-ship -ship combat and duels with enemy captains. Pirates are often used as go-to bad guys, such as in the Disney TV tie-in Goof Troop. After all, Buccaneers are a pretty inoffensive villain that proves a perfect fit for any island adventure. The second in the popular Donkey Kong Country series, Diddy's Conquest, leans heavily on the pirate cliché too, but it's a good fit for the colourful tone, tropical fruit, and quest for booty. In the wake of Sid Meier's pirate's popularity, there were a slew of titles that tackled the strategy behind seafaring. Games like Age of Sail and High Seas Trader gave you the freedom of the oceans, with ship and crew management set against a historical backdrop. 97 saw the release of a third entry in the Monkey Island series, in The Curse of Monkey Island. An audiovisual upgrade on previous titles, the game ran at a higher resolution and was the first in the series to feature voice acting. And although a departure in style from the originals, the game retains the same light-hearted charm. Overboard, also known as Shipwreckers in North America, took a slightly different approach to piracy, with the top-down viewpoint of a tactical ship combat game, but with the gameplay of an arcade shooter. Captain Claw was a PC-exclusive platform game from Monolith that featured an anthropomorphic feline pirate tackling canine foes, the so-called Cocker Spaniards, true to theme. In an era when the FPS was king, it's odd to see such a 2D title on PC, but with smooth action, digitised speech and colourful graphics, it was an accomplished platformer. Some might say the late 90s was a golden era for PC gaming, and no other platform supports strategy games quite as well. Corsairs from Microids lets you lead a flotilla of privateers, and a letter of mark gives charge to tackle enemy ports across the Caribbean, earning gold for upgrades as you go. Cutthroat's Terror on the High Seas granted a similar level of freedom, a recurring trend in pirate strategy, with the player free to forge their own story as they pillage the Spanish main. Meanwhile, the Uncharted Water series lived on, with a number of sequels released solely in the East for the PlayStation, Saturn and PC. Known as the Daikukai Jidai series, which translates as Age of Discovery. Within its native market, it attracted a great following, eventually leading to an MMORPG in 2005. The new millennium saw the release of the long awaited fourth instalment of the Monkey Island series, Escape from Monkey Island. It took the leap to a fully three dimensional world, leaving the 2D scum engine behind in favour of a 3D one first used by Grim Fandango. Its idiosyncratic controls and clunky interface drew some criticism, the simplicity of the classic point-and-click interface somewhat lost. Although it's not without charm, it is generally regarded as the weakest of the franchise. Now, not every pirate theme game is set on the ocean. With a touch of fantasy, it's possible to have pirates inhabit the sky. While the focus in this video is the sea, it's hard to ignore the nautical influence within the skies of Arcadia. The airships resemble conventional vessels, with sails, rigging, and a crow's nest atop. It's just that they're born on clouds rather than waves. 
the Jules Verne-style world serves as a charming base for the JRPG, with typical turn-based combat and random encounters serving as the portions of gameplay between the narrative. Sea Dogs is another RPG, this time of the Western ilk, developed in Russia by studio Arkela. Realistic in tone, it places you in the boots of a privateer and gives you free reign to explore a fictional Caribbean archipelago. The game was planned to have a sequel, Sea Dogs 2, but eventually this was released as a movie tie-in game for the Pirates of the Caribbean for the Xbox and PC in 2003. Arkela were also responsible for Age of Sail 2, a more tactical ship combat simulator in which you command a formation of warships against another. With a focus on realism and the accurate portrayal of naval combat, there are a host of ships from the era and a large number of historical scenarios to reenact. 2002's The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker on the GameCube had a distinctly nautical theme, with the overworld comprising a chain of islands. The adventure starts after the rescue of pirate captain Tetra, after which it's all aboard a pirate ship on a quest to save Link's sister. Westwood Studios tried their hand at pirate action the same year, and with a female protagonist no less. Pirates The Legend of Black Cat's titular character is Caterina de Leon, on a quest for vengeance and in search of her mother's grave. The first in the Port Royale series was released this year too, with a similar approach to other pirate strategy games, but with an increased focus on trade, asset management and town building. More piratical town construction was had in the 2003 sequel to Banana Republic sim Tropico, in Tropico 2 Pirate Cove, in which you're given the keys to the stockade on a pirate-controlled island. Your management skills are put to the test, as you must balance keeping your captive workers terrified and productive, and your pirate chums happy and full of grog. Puzzle Pirates is a free-to-play massively multiplayer game whose title adequately explains its contents. Plenty of puzzles amidst a piratical theme. Although the games are simple, players are rewarded with pieces of eight for each task completed, eventually ranking up and acquiring customization items for their avatar and abode. 2004 saw Firaxis tackle a remake of Sid Meier's classic Pirates. With updated graphics and some added minigames over the original, it was a fresh coat of paint for a classic formula. Similarly refreshed was Port Royale, with its sequel much in the same vein as the first, slightly improved presentation and as strong a focus on a micromanaged economy as ever. Xbox exclusive title Galleon, designed by the original creator of Lara Croft, endured a tortuous seven years in development before finally emerging to lukewarm reviews. Movie tie-in games are an inevitability where large franchises are concerned, and with the second and third of the Pirates of the Caribbean series emerging in 2006 and 2007, there were a spate of games released across Gen 6, Gen 7 and the handhelds. Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End was one such game, a thoroughly average action-adventure game featuring a familiar cast. There was also an MMORPG released the same year, Pirates of the Caribbean Online, although it has since closed. In Zack and Wiki, quest for Barbaros's treasure, you see the hopeful pirate Zack and his monkey companion Wiki on a quest for long-lost treasure. The game takes heavy inspiration from earlier point-and-click adventures, with the Wiimote put to good use in solving puzzles. The game reviewed well across the board, but sadly lacklustre sales scuppered the chances of any sequels. Age of Booty hit the Xbox Live Arcade in 2008, a competitive resource-gathering strategy multiplayer game in which you plunder ports and tackle your opponent's ships. From the Age of Booty to the Quest for Booty in the second title of the Ratchet & Clank Future series, the nuts and bolts of this action platformer see the starring duo go toe-to-toe -to -toe with space pirates. Pirates of the Burning Sea is one of a few pirate MMORPGs, with four factions to choose from and a range of career paths in lieu of traditional classes. It runs the full pirate gamut, from swashbuckling PvP with a variety of sword fighting styles to naval trading and tactical combat. Age of Pirates 2 City of Abandoned Ships was released in 2009 and is the fourth of the Corsairs series as it's known in its native market, 
and a sequel to the earlier Sea Dogs. As with the prior titles, it's an open-ended pirate RPG, in which you can wander from port to port, conducting a nautical career under your chosen banner. Although the Monkey Island series had long been dormant by this point, Telltale Games picked up the license in 2009 in order to produce an episodic adventure. Certainly the better of the two 3D interpretations of Guybrush, Telltale might be one of few developers able to successfully employ the episodic formula, and Tales of Monkey Island at least proved the potential for the series' return. Monkey Island is held dear by many people, and there have been many adventure games which borrow from the series' trademark humour. One such title was Jolly Rover. In the traditional 2D point-and-click vein, the game tells the tale of salty pirate dogs and the struggles of the main protagonist, a dachshund named Gaius James Rover. The fourth Pirates of the Caribbean film screened in 2011, and this time a LEGO game accompanied it. It sticks to the usual formula, with a host of characters from the films, and drop-in, drop-out cooperative puzzles to complete in a quest for studs. The third entry in the Port Royale series, Pirates and Merchants, came to the Gen 7 consoles and PC in 2012. Open-ended in approach, the key focus was in trading, but more unsavoury paths such as buccaneering are always viable too. Borderlands 2 had an entire DLC devoted to Captain Scarlet and her pirate's booty, although it comes with a distinctly Borderlands-style approach. Risen 2 Dark Waters is a Western RPG that blends traditional fantasy with pirate adventure, in which the eyepatch-wearing protagonist is called upon to defeat a mighty kraken by means of a magic weapon. There was a departure in theme from the first Risen, which was more for landlubbers. And in a similar fashion, things took a nautical turn in Assassin's Creed 4. Black Flag built on the nautical combat in 3 and expanded the game into a fully-fledged exploration of the golden age of piracy. The open-world formula of Assassin's Creed was a good fit for the life of a pirate. It's almost a shame there wasn't a purer focus on the piratical exploits. There's something oddly comforting about Captain in a Ship. With the wind at your back, the waves on your bow, and colourful sea shanties from your crew before you. Arr, it's a pirate's life for me. And thus we pull into a familiar port. Our voyage of discovery through interactive pirate adventures has come to a close. Of all potential thematic settings, the golden age of piracy is amongst the most charming. A romantic age of the new world, with conflict aplenty and booty for all. Perhaps that's why it's a natural fit for video games. The freedom of the ocean and the discovery of a new world, all caught between fearsome pirates and naval forces, and the promise of more filthy lucre than you could ever hope to plunder. As ever, this video is not intended to be an exhaustive list. And while I've done my research, there are always a few titles that slip through the cracks or are simply impossible to record. But I'm sure you'll let me know what you think are the most egregious omissions in the comments. In any case, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, farewell.